Okay, CTC 145, welcome to the lecture on dissolution and disintegration. Okay, so you're probably watching this lecture video wondering what dissolution and disintegration is, and that's the purpose of what we're getting ready to do. So we're going to break it down. We're going to kind of label this as part A for dissolution, and we're going to label this as part B for disintegration, and you're going to be doing both of these in the lab experiment. All right, so without wasting any more of your time, let's have a chat. Okay, well, what are we going to chat about, Tracy? Well, we're going to chat about pills. And here are different variations of pills. Well, here's the kicker. A lot of people use this word pill, and it just describes everything under the umbrella of what a pharmaceutical company might make and distribute out to their clients or to their facilities. Well, pill, uh, we can also use the word tablet. And this is really the distinction here. It is a tablet versus a capsule. So on the screen, you are seeing different versions of tablets and different versions of capsules. What I need you to take away from this lecture, one of the things, is that a tablet is typically some type of hard coating on the outside. All right, it's just really a powder and that powder is pressed and that powder holds its shape due to the bonders. So for instance, an aspirin tablet, something like this is regarded as a tablet. It might feel hard, but it doesn't necessarily have a different type of coating on the outside of it. There's no additional layer that's keeping the contents inside until you swallow it. So that is a tablet. A capsule, on the other hand, a capsule is typically soft. That's how you have seen the majority of them. It doesn't have to be that way every single time. But a soft capsule is some kind of additional layer around the active pharmaceutical ingredient. So active pharmaceutical ingredient is API, and A is active. P is pharmaceutical, and I is ingredient. That is what that stands for. So it's keeping our API on the inside of the capsule, and we have created this coating that goes around the outside of the peel that will slowly dissolve or burst open once we swallow it, all right? But this can be soft, or they can kind of be a hard coating as well. Maybe you've seen some of these. And this is a hard coating that I can probably grab, and it's not uncommon to pull these halves away from each other, and that will basically show the inside of the peel and the powder and the active pharma ingredient, okay? We also have effervescents. Effervescents are typically tablets that we drop down into water. It produces a lot of gas, a lot of suds, and a lot of bubbles. So if you ever hear someone talk about an effervescent tablet, that's basically what that means. All right, so as you can imagine, if we are working in a pharmaceutical-related environment, folks, all of these tablets and all of these pills have to be tested. If they are not tested, then we cannot guarantee that we are giving you a quality product throughout this process. If we're not giving you a quality product, then what on earth are you taking as a consumer? So the things that we have to do with tablets, once they are produced, we typically undergo two different types of tests, and that is part A, dissolution, and part B, disintegration. Those are the two that we're going to be talking about in the lab. So let's talk about the first one, and the first one is dissolution. Here's the beauty, dissolution. 7-Eleven, what does 7-Eleven stands for? This is in regards to a USP appendix. That appendix is 7-Eleven, and this basically gives us all of the information that we need in order to do the dissolution test. 
Okay, so 7-Eleven, dissolution, USP, appendix. It gives me the information about the machine, but it doesn't tell me how to operate the machine. No, it doesn't tell you how to operate the machine. There's so many different instruments that are out there. They're all made slightly different in how they operate. But the basics of the instrument are the same. And the reason is because the USP, which is the United States Pharmacopeia, mandates all of the dimensions, all of the lengths, the widths, the heights, the materials that these instruments are made out of. It's all regulated. So it doesn't matter which version, which company that you have in the lab, they all have to do the same job in the exact same way. It's just instrumentation brand familiarity for you. All right, so dissolution, there it is. And what is the purpose? Well, it basically measures how a pill dissolves, folks. I mean, that's what it does. So what will go on is that I will have a pill and I will eventually take this pill and bloop, drop it down into the vat of solution. And there is a paddle. You can see that in the image. There's a big stainless steel rod that goes all the way down. And we see a paddle down here at the very bottom. And that paddle begins to turn slowly around and around and around and around for maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes. That just really depends on the tablet that we're trying to study, right? There's no rhyme or reason to this as far as we're concerned at this point. We just do what is told, and what is told is always in the USP monograph, and that's where we get these values from. So the pill gets dropped into the vat, the paddle turns on, the paddle spins over a course of time, and at the end of the time limit, I will then take whoop, a sample of that dissolution medium. And then we'll analyze that sample and we'll see what's present. Folks, this is what dissolution is all about. That's all that this instrument does. How does the pill break apart? And then we'll take a portion of that solution and we will run it in a laboratory to basically see how much is actually there. How much of the pill did dissolve up on me? So a couple of things that you need to keep in mind when we look at this instrument. Number one, we have these vessels and they always typically hold about 900 mils. That is what we're using almost every single time. And the reason for that is because that is the volume of our tummies. So as we walk around, we have a liter beaker inside of our body, at least. And that liter of solution or 900 mils of solution is kind of mimicking what this dissolution is doing or vice versa. This dissolution is almost like your tummy. The pill goes into your tummy and it begins to break apart. All right. The medium can also vary. It doesn't have to be water, but it can be. Uh, it can be solutions like buffers. It can be solutions of hydrochloric acid. It could be a gastric solution that is closer to what's in your tummy. It could be an intestinal solution that is closer to what's in your intestines and not in your tummy. It just really depends on the pill. It depends on the manufacturer. It depends on what the purpose of the active pharmaceutical ingredient or API is all about. Okay. In the monograph, you're also going to see two things here, and that is RPM and time. RPM is rotations per minute, and that is basically how fast these paddles or baskets turn, because there's two different main versions of this that we can see. The time, how long does it take to analyze it? That's what we're seeing there. This could be a 15-minute, a 30-minute, or a 45-minute runtime, but the USP will let us know. So folks, these RPM and time limits have to be determined in the USP, and we have to make those user settings whenever we analyze the pill that we have in hand. And that's the purpose of this big fat screen up here at the very top, or some kind of computer software that is often used to control this device. So very often we are double checking the rotation, and we are double checking the time uh, that we need to enter into these instruments uh, just to give us a cue that our time is up, our cake is done, and that we need to pull an aliquot of sample 
out of the vessel. All right, so RPM and time have to be set by the user. You always double check these folks. Uh, sometimes these instruments remember what was done prior and those settings could be completely different than what you need. So always double check these and make sure that you are choosing the right settings for these instruments, okay? Uh, next, this monograph. I keep referring to the monograph, the USP, the USP, the USP. The USP is loaded with monographs. So if you've not taken our 115 quality control course yet, and this is something that you'll see much later on, but a monograph is just basically testing parameters. It is just a lab experiment. That's all that it is. And it's telling you the procedure and it's telling you the settings that you need in order to do your job. So for instance, let me show you an example of a monograph excerpt from the USP and this is what it looks like. So whatever pill that I pulled, there is a entry in the monograph, which is the page listing that this pill might be on. And up underneath the monograph, you will see a test. And this test says disintegration and dilution, dissolution. That's what we're doing. So it's going to give me the method parameters. It's going to give me a little bit of information about these two tests when I do them in the lab. So the medium, it says water, 900 mils. So this is what goes into the vessel, folks. So here, I just literally go get Diana's water, and I'll just crank it up to 900 mils in a graduated cylinder, and I'll pour that 900 mils into that vessel, and away I go. That's all that I really have to do there. So this medium, super, super easy. But if this was a buffer, it will tell you that it would be a buffer. Or maybe it is a weakened solution of hydrochloric acid. And if so, then that's what it is, and it will probably give me a recipe or some insight on how to make these solutions. Okay, uh, apparatus number two, uh, this is important because this is referring to different types of dissolutions that are out there. Uh, we're going to talk about that in just a minute, but this is going to give you a point of reference. So in the back of the USP, you will see dissolution section. And in the dissolution section, there'll be different diagrams. And it will say apparatus one, and apparatus two, and apparatus maybe three. So you get the drift. So apparatus number two is what I need to use. And it says 75 rotations per minute. So that is a setting that I need to use on my dissolution when I do this test. The time interval is 60 minutes. So that means I'm going to be twiddling my thumbs for one hour, 60 minutes in total, before I get to go back and pull a sample at the very end. So this means from the top that I, or from the time that I drop the pill into the vessel. Okay, so that's really it. There's our time interval. There's our RPM. I told you those were settings. And what goes into the vessel? Not water every single time, but the monograph will tell me what goes on the inside. All right? Okay, so I told you there are two major differences between the dissolution systems, and here they are. Uh, the image over to the left you're going to see is the paddle version. So we typically like to use paddles. It seems like we use paddles all the time. But our peel goes down, and our paddle gets lowered, and our paddle begins to spin and stir that solution up, and it will help kind of distribute that peel evenly throughout the vessel. That's the purpose of using the paddle and the RPM. As you can imagine, if I do this really slow, well, it's not going to be mixing up properly. If I do this too fast, then it's going to spin it out completely, and the whole thing's going to be broken down within five minutes, and that's not what we want either. That's why these things have to be controlled. Uh, the other version is a basket, and here I see a basket, and it is. It's a little bitty mesh basket that I can put the peel on the inside, and that's what they're calling the dosage form. So the dosage form goes on inside of the basket, and then this snaps pink, into place, and that gets attached to a big rod that goes up into the dissolution instrument. So this basket actually does turn just like the paddle turns over here on the left. The difference is that in version one, like this one, you are seeing a peel on the bottom, and in this version, you're seeing a peel inside of the basket. 
okay? So those are the two or one of the major differences between the two dissolution apparatuses that we will often see in our laboratory. There, there's more than this, but what we often stumble across are either paddle methods or basket methods, and that's basically what that means. Okay, uh, this image is showing you uh, a laboratory worker that is over at a dissolution system. And as you can see, this basket is getting ready to either be pulled off or she's putting it back on. And there, if she's putting it back on, there is a peel on the inside of this. Uh, so uh, they are prepping the dosage. They are prepping the basket here. And that is what those systems look like when we need to use them. Okay, uh, so other than that, folks, Folks, I'm telling you, dissolution super simple. Uh, there's not too much that needs to go into the description of this because, once more, it's just measuring how the pill is breaking up over time. And that's it. All right, so a couple of things that I need to talk about as far as dissolution goes uh, and usage of the dissolution. So here we've talked about a vat now, and on the inside of this vat, I have a pill on the inside with basically a solution. And over a course of time, I'm going to take an aliquot of that solution and I'm going to measure this one and analyze it in some form or fashion after this time interval is over. Well, okay, this is great and all, but this is what we would call a fixed time or a one point time. And that's it, that's all that we're doing. So we literally, if it's 60 minutes, drop the pill, let it spin, come back in one hour and take an aliquot out of it. We have only pulled one point. That's it. We're analyzing that one pull, that one aliquot. That's it. And no other questions are asked. However, dissolution can also be used in a different way. So in a dissolution vat, so here it is, and my solution's down on the inside, and here's a pill that's floating around in that solution. I can perform some type of assay on this. And this assay is typically in the world of kinetics. And kinetics means speed. And kinetics means how fast. So what will happen in this dissolution setup is that I make multiple pulls. So maybe there is a 10-minute pull. And then in 20 minutes, make another one. In 30 minutes, make another one. In 40 minutes, make another one. In 50 minutes, make another one. In 60 minutes, make another one. All right? So each one of these aliquots can be pulled from a dissolution vessel over a series of time intervals. And I will have a sample for each one of these. And we will analyze each one of them. Okay, so what would be the purpose in doing something like this? Well, it's measuring how fast the pill is dissolving. Not just did it dissolve fully at the end as expected, but how fast is it doing that? And what we do is that after we analyze each one of these pulls, we make a chart. And 10 minutes and 20 minutes and 30 minutes and 40 minutes and 50 minutes and 60 minutes. And over a course of time, we will look at concentration as it's getting larger and larger and larger throughout the vat or throughout the time period. So what we typically see here is a flat line in the beginning. The peel is starting to break apart. Nothing's really going on. And then we see a shroom that goes all the way up. And this means that the pill is breaking apart. And then after a certain point in time, it will level off because the majority of the pill has broken up. The majority of the pill has released what it's going to release at that point. And we typically see kind of a flat plateau that begins to happen there. So what this does, it allows me as an analyst to go in and say, hey, this pill broke apart in the dissolution system. And this pill broke apart about here because after that point, we really didn't get an increase in concentration or anything. So if this was 10 minutes and this was 20 minutes and this was 30 minutes, it would give a pharmaceutical company an idea of how this pill is breaking apart 
in 900 mils of water or medium that is supposed to kind of represent your stomach. So if you took this pill in real life, we can say it takes about 30 minutes for it all to break up and for the API to be released so that your body can begin to absorb it. That is the purpose of the assay or the kinetics study of dissolution when we do them, all right? And that's what you're gonna see on this screen here. This is a one point versus a kinetic study. So one point is done only at one time and you're measuring simply did it break up enough to pass and the kinetic study is multiple aliquots over a course of time to really monitor and measure how it is breaking up and the speed at which it's breaking up. Uh, here are dissolution rates or dissolution rate curves. And this is basically what you would see if you were required to do a multiple pull using a dissolution system. All right, so there's a couple of things that happen here. The blue line and the red line that you're seeing on the screen right now, this blue line is uncoated. That means that it is a tablet. There's no special layer on the outside of it to keep the tablet together or the API on the inside. And the red line is film coated. So this is an extra coating that goes on the outside of maybe the tablet that begins to break up over a series of time. Well, as you can see, the coatings, if they are using them, will greatly affect how the pill dissolves and break up over time. So if you ever grab one of those pill bottles in a grocery store or at Walmart or at the pharmacy and you see the words extended relief or release, maybe it is giving you relief, but it's releasing the active pharmaceutical ingredient, the API. If you see this, this is probably designed in such a way that this pill will slowly dissolve over a course of time and not immediately just break apart and all of the inside gets absorbed. It is extended. It is slowing it down. It is preventing it from breaking apart the way that a typical tablet would. So coatings affected, bonders affected, the formulation, which means the ingredients affect it. There are a number of different things that really change how a pill dissolves up on us. All right. Now that's just part B so or part A. So in part A, you will be using a dissolution just like she is. And you're going to be dropping a pill down into the vat. You're going to be putting a paddle on it. You're going to be setting the right temperature. You're going to be setting the right time. You're going to be setting the right rotations per minute. And you're going to allow those things to drop boop, and uh, spin around. And you're going to come back in 60 minutes to see what has happened at that point. So that's as easy as that is. Other than getting the machine started up and ready to run, folks, that's really all that you have to do with this experiment. All right, so part B is disintegration. And this is a little different. It has a different appendix number because it's a different instrument. It's different theory. So this is 701. So 711 and 701. Did you remember the gas station 711? I remember those gas stations 711. Big cops. Okay, so 701. Uh, is in terms of disintegration. And this is even easier, okay? It, it really isn't even as complicated as dissolution is, but it's very similar. The only thing that we are monitoring here is how that pill breaks up. Does it break up? Yes or no? That's the question. We're not actually pulling any aliquots from these typically. It is just simply a dunk tank. That's it, folks, a dunk tank. And the peel is sitting in the dunk tank, and it's going to get dunked over and over and over. So I hope that you're a good pitch or a good throw. All right, so mainly it's used to determine if that peel, tablet or capsule, is going to break up with a certain amount of time. No aliquots, no calibration curves, no standards. It is simply qualitative based. Does it break up? Yes or no. And breaking up means, does it go through the mesh that's on the inside of these baskets? If the pill goes through the mesh and it falls into the beaker, then it did disintegrate on us and break up over a course of time. Now, these baskets that I just circled, they typically have six chambers 
and those six chambers all will hold the same type of pill at one time. So normally what goes on is that these baskets, you will drop a pill into each one of those chambers. It will be the same pill for everything. But honestly, folks, we're not going to do that in our lab. And the reason that we're not going to do that in our lab is because that's a waste. I think that we can do one pill, get the idea of what disintegration is supposed to be about. And that way, if we do work for a pharmaceutical company or someone later on, well, we know to put six pills into it and do our thing with disintegration. Here's a better picture of the basket that you're going to be seeing when you use our disintegration instruments. Uh, each one of these baskets will hold the pill. Boom, 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 boom one there in each one and each one of those pills will basically be dunked and 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 dunked over a course of 30 minutes typically so these pills will break apart these pills will go through the little mesh screen at the very bottom and if it goes through that mesh screen then it does break up and it disintegrates and we pass it but if if we were doing this for real and we did six pills all of the same kind and one of those tablets did not break up just one then folks the usp tells us that we're going to have to get two baskets at this point and do an additional 12 tablets and this will bring our total to 18 12 from the second run and 6 from the original runs. And 16 out of the 18 need to pass. And then we say, monograph-wise, that the tablet passes. If 16 does not pass but 15 do, the tablet fails. The tablet has to be notified to the company that makes it, the formulations department, Everyone else has to be involved on why this tablet did not break down the way we said it was going to break down. All right, now we have an issue with the disintegration, and the issue with the disintegration is that we have pills, and these pills can, boop, 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 they can float up to the top if we are not careful. And we don't want the pill to float to the top because if it floats to the top, what's going to happen to it? It's going to float out. And that we have to prevent. So we do this a number of different ways. Number one, the surface of this basket never should go below the liquid that's in that beaker. The majority of the basket does. The majority of the basket does get dunked into the solution, but we have to make sure that the top of this basket does not get fully submerged. That should stay above the surface of the liquid a little bit, all right? The second way that we help prevent this is that we use a disc. This disc is weighted just a little bit, not much, and this disc basically goes on top of the peel that we put down inside of a chamber. And the disc will help hold the peel uh, in the basket. And the disc will also provide some kind of friction for the peel. Now, sometimes not all peels require this. Sometimes we don't use it. And the monograph will tell us that. Okay, depending on the type of pill that we have, sometimes we use the disc and sometimes we don't. So this helps prevent the floaties from happening. It also helps the pill to break up, give it a little bit of jigger movement throughout this process, but you only use it when you're allowed to use it, right? Now, there are different pills. We talked about this already. And different pills really do mean something in particular for disintegration because it's going to kind of determine whether or not we use a disc. All right, so here are the settings for disintegration. Uh, it's not all the time one size fits all here, folks, right? And we really have to understand what we are working with before we get turned loose on disintegration. So a typical uncoated tablet that you're seeing right here 
this typical uncoated tablet has a bath, a water, or a fluid in the beaker at 37 plus or minus 2 degrees. And the disintegration is going to be ran for 30 minutes. And it's 30 minutes for whatever the pill is, unless it says something different in the monograph. If time is not given in the monograph, we assume it's 30 minutes because that's how this method is written. And you do add a disk to that tube if you have an uncoated tablet. All right? Okay, so these are run-of-the-mill, pretty cheap, pretty standard, typical aspirin tablets and things like that. The next one are plain coated tablets. Now, you're going to have to know a little bit about the tablet that you're working with. And one of the things that you have to question is, is the coated material made out of sugar? And if it is, then we do something a little bit different. If it is a sugar coated tablet, then you are going to put that pill and immerse it into the dunk tank for five minutes. And you leave it there for five minutes undisturbed. You lower it and keep it still. That's what immersed means, right? Then after that five minutes, you'll add a disc on top of that pill, and then you start the disintegration. You start the dunking process after that point. The purpose of that five minutes is to help break apart that sugar coating so that pill can actually start dissolving up for you in terms of the disintegration settings. Now, the next two are delayed release tablets. Delayed release tablets, you know what those are. Those are extended release, delayed release, a number of names that they can go by, but it prolongs the pill dissolving and releasing the API. Now, in parentheses, you'll see the word enteric coded. It's kind of another word that those go by. And the first delayed release is a tablet, and the second delayed release, uh, release is a soft shell capsule. So if you have a delayed release, number one, you do not use a disc. All right? No matter what thing that you're using, you do not use a disc in the disintegration apparatus. If it is a sugar coating, you do it just like before. You soak it for five minutes. But you don't soak it in five minutes using water. Okay? Typically, these up here, these, almost all the time are water, unless it says something different. But the delayed release is a little bit different because they are forcing you to not use water here. You've got to use gastric fluid, which means tummy, tummy acid, and gastric fluid for this one as well. And that should go on for one hour, not 30 minutes. So if I had a delayed release, a tablet with a sugar coating, I take the pill, no disc. I dunk the pill in solution for five minutes. That solution is gastric fluid. After five minutes, I hit the play button and it dunks and dunks and dunks and dunks and dunks and dunks and dunks for one hour, not the traditional run of the mill 30 minutes here. In that one hour, I then pull the basket up and no disintegration should happen here. None, not one thing. And the reason for this is because extended release or delayed release really does its job in your intestinal tract, not necessarily in your stomach. So one hour, no disintegration should be present. And then we switch the fluids and the fluid will now go to an intestinal fluid with a different pH. And then we dunk and dunk and dunk and dunk and dunk and dunk and dunk for the time that's listed in the monograph. And then we lift it up and then we look to see if the pills have fully broken apart. That's how delayed release are a little bit different than the run-of-the-mill tablet that we're going to be working with in this particular laboratory. All right? So delayed release is a little more complicated. It requires us to use, in the beginning, one pH solution. We switch it out. 
We then use another pH solution, and then we monitor to see how that actually breaks apart at that point. Softshell capsules are the same way, folks. It's still no disc. It's still gastric fluid for an hour, no disintegration. It's still intestinal fluid, but not more than 60 minutes here. So again, the monograph will kind of tell you what you should be doing, and that's always the source of information that we go to. All right, down here at the bottom are hard shell capsules and soft shell capsules. Uh, hard shell capsules, again, those are the ones that you can typically pull apart and release the ingredients. These uncoated tablets typically require a buffer in order to start to dissolve the outside of that capsule. And we also attach what they call a wire cloth to the top of the basket. It normally goes 30 minutes, just like our normal run-of-the-mill tablets do. But that's really the only difference is the acetate buffer. The soft shell capsules, uh, the pills that you can kind of squeeze and maybe you'll see liquid or something on the inside. Uh, that's 500 mils of water, not the traditional 900 mils of water that we use for these systems. Uh, it is a different system altogether. The baskets are not three channel or it's six channel. They're three channeled. Uh, and they operate under different settings. So soft shell capsules are a pain because it really requires us to reset everything that we're doing in terms of disintegration at that point. Uh, but the determination of whether it passes disintegration is the same for everything. So we're looking for 16 out of 18 if we have to go that far. But hopefully the first six are going to be fine. All right, uh, the hard versus the soft, folks, here you go. This is a close-up picture of soft shell capsules versus a hard shell capsule. The hard shell capsule feels like a little bit like plastic, some kind of hard coating. Again, a top half and a bottom half. You can probably pull these apart from each other and you have that powder or that API on the inside. The soft shell, you can squeeze on the outsides of these. Uh, they typically feel gummy, tacky, sticky sometimes, and the insides are normally filled with some kind of liquid, but that is the difference between a hard shell and a soft shell capsule. All right, so in today's lab, we're actually going to be testing zinc citrate tablets. And we picked zinc citrate for a number of reasons, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. But zinc citrate is a dietary supplement. And all dietary supplements, folks, they can put things on the bottles. They can put things on the labels that are not necessarily true. So here's an advertisement for zinc citrate. And it says, supports the immune function, asterisk. Okay, that's a dead giveaway right there. And then works to support the heart, asterisk. And benefits the eyes, asterisk. And contributes to oral health, asterisk. All right, so all of these are statements that they are putting on a label. And then when you look at what the asterisk really means, here it, here's what's on the label. Here's what's on the label to the consumer. And it says, quote verbatim, consult a healthcare provider before taking any supplement Statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. All right, so here's where the misconception lies. People might grab a zinc citrate bottle and say, zinc citrate, this is going to be a zinc source. I need to take zinc because it's going to boost my immune system and I'm not going to get sick because of it. <coughs> it's almost like an old wife's tale. Some people claim and swear by these. Others, it doesn't do anything for them at all. But wait a minute, it says support immune function. Well, it does say that, but it also says that the FDA has not made any determination if that's even true or not. And they're telling you that on the bottle that you're buying. We don't know if it's true. We're telling you right now, do not use this to cure any kind of disease at all or ailment that you're having. But they can get by with these statements because they're putting the clauses of the statements on the label as well, or in the advertisement that you're seeing. 
All right, so these are the tablets that we're going to be working with today. They are zinc citrate tablets. Uh, they are going to break apart because they should, and they are going to release some zinc, and they're going to release some citrate. All right, now here's the thing. If they are going to release zinc, then that's great because zinc is classified as a metal. On the periodic chart, you're going to see the valley elements. That's what I refer to these as. So the valley elements are going to be right here in the middle. And all of these are transition metals. Zinc is part of that family. And we can analyze this metal by using an instrument called an AA system. And the AA is tuned in order to detect metals like the valley elements, and tell us how much is actually present. If we know how much zinc is present, then we will know how much zinc citrate was present. And if we know how much zinc citrate was present, then we know how much of the pill dissolved because the pill will have a label on it. And that label will tell me how much zinc is present if I take each pill, all right? So that's how this process is going to work and that's why we've chosen what we've chosen. All right, so here are some more statements about zinc and zinc citrate. Uh, zinc, immune system, people swear by it. They don't get the flu, they don't get the common cold. Some people even said they didn't get the coronavirus because they took zinc pills. Next is digestive health support. So taking zinc, helps improve digestion. So if you've got diarrhea, a bloaty stomach, an upset stomach, then people typically gravitate toward a zinc supplement and they take these zinc supplements to help that process for them. Behavioral support. Well, this is kind of in regards to children, I hope not adults, but it maintains what they call normal behavior in children. Next is skin health support. If your body has a tendency to break out in some kind of bump, some kind of acne, some kind of rash, this could be due to really low levels of zinc in your diet. So a zinc supplement could possibly help with that. But again, none of these are really kind of validated. None of these are really heavily studied. They do have studies to go along with them or we wouldn't be making these comments. But they're not approved to treat, cure, or diagnose anything at all. All right? All right, so when you get the pill bottle, this might be one of your brands. It might not be. But what I need you to look for when you get this pill bottle is I need you to look for, number one, serving size. Make sure this says one capsule. If it says two capsules, then the servings per container will give you an amount that is not per one capsule. In this case, it is. So one capsule, and it says zinc as zinc citrate. And this capsule is going to give me 30 milligrams of zinc. If this pill fully breaks apart and gets released and does what it's supposed to do. So one capsule releases 30 milligrams of zinc, and I'm going to test if this sucker really does give me 30 milligrams of zinc or not, okay? Now, if this said two capsules and 30 milligrams based on that serving, then I'm going to have to take 30 divided by two, and that gives me 15 milligrams. This is 15 milligrams per tablet. And the reason I'm saying that is because the dissolution system that we're going to be measuring this with, it is a vat, and that vat takes one pill, not two pills. So one pill gets dropped down into the vat, and that one pill should release everything that that one pill should have in it. And in this case, for this particular brand, it is a 30 milligram pill. All right, so that's something that you need to look for. Make sure that you write that down. We need to know the brand of the pill that you're using. We also need to know the milligram amount on the nutritional label or the supplement facts is how they have called it here. All right. 
We could provide you a number of different zinc citrate bottles. Uh, these could come from a different sources. We could get you to do one. We could get you to do all of them that we provide. We could get you to do a couple. It just really depends on how we're feeling at the moment, okay? So whatever we give you, again, make sure that you write down the brand name in your lab notebook. That's going to be pretty important. You're also going to want to write down the number of milligrams per pill, which is typically one capsule serving size on the bottle, okay? These things can range from 30 milligrams, 15 milligrams, 10 milligrams. Uh, I don't really ever think I've seen anything over 50 though. But again, just double check them, write down what you're actually using. Up in the top right hand side, you're going to see the form of zinc citrate. That is the chemical structure for zinc citrate. And you're seeing a little bit of zinc here. And you're seeing some zinc here that connects the two pieces. And you're seeing a little bit of zinc there. The other parts are the citrate pieces, or at least that's how I want you to think about these. So there you go. There is zinc citrate in case you're curious. And that's what that thing looks like. All right. So again, we're going back to zinc citrate. This is the monograph that was pulled for zinc citrate. It is verbatim what is inside of the USP for this particular type of supplement. So we are going to be using water in this experiment. So when I go over to the dissolution vessel or disintegration, I'm going to be measuring 900 mils of just water and I'm pouring it into that vat. Apparatus number two, we're going to be using a paddle here, all right? And that paddle is going to be lowered down into the vessel. And this paddle is going to be set to spin at 75 RPM. The time interval here is going to be 60 minutes for dissolution, dissolution, dissolution. And after 60 minutes, I will come with my syringe and I will suck that solution out of that vessel. Now, what do I do with it after this? Right, that's going to be another question. Now that I've went through dissolution and disintegration, what do I do now that this pill has broken up and I need to analyze it? Okay, well, here's what will happen, or here is what goes on. So folks, here's how this breakdown is going to be. Um, I'm going to have this vessel, and this vessel is going to have my pill in it. I've taken an aliquot out, and this aliquot is a portion of that solution that's there in my dissolution setup. So one of the first things that we're going to have to do here is just figure out really what we're working with, what's expected. In other words, what is the theory? Okay, so let's imagine for a moment that my pill states that I have 30 milligrams per pill. Okay, so I've taken that one pill, I've put it in the dissolution vessel. In 60 minutes, that pill is going to break up, and I hope that it releases all 30 milligrams of zinc that that pill contains. So we're going to have to do a little bit of math here, all right? So the little bit of math is going to be 30 milligrams, and I have hopefully have contained that in 900 milliliters of water, because that's what zinc citrate needs. It's water as the medium. Well, I need to convert that to liter, so 900 mils is actually 0.9 liter. So if I have 30 milligrams in 0.9 liter, we need to calculate a concentration here. So what we'll do is I'll take 30, and I'll divide by 0.9, and I'll hit enter on my calculator, and I'm going to get 33.33. .33. And this is milligram per liter, right? There it is, milligram per liter. It's right there. So milligram per liter is also known as part per million, PPM, parts per million. And this is the theory, PPM, of what would come from a tablet if all of it dissolves up in the dissolution. 
Okay, so we're going to take this another step further. Now that I have this, I need to analyze that aliquot. Is it really 33.33 part per million? Yes or no? That's what we're here to find out. And I've already told you that zinc is a metal, and zinc does an excellent job getting detected by an instrument called AA, which is atomic absorption. So I'm going to have to take this aliquot, and I'm going to have to analyze that on the AA instrument in order to figure out how much zinc is present. The problem here, though, is that whatever you get, Maybe yours did not have 30 milligrams. Maybe it had 50. Maybe it had 15. I don't know what you're going to get. But you need to do this calculation first. But whatever the case is here, folks, this is probably way too much. It doesn't matter what it is. It's going to be way too much. So this solution is going to be too strong to analyze directly pulling it out of the vat. That means I'm going to have to dilute it. Very, very important. I'm going to have to dilute it the proper way. So how do I dilute it? Well, that is really corresponding to the atomic absorption again. The AA is made a different way depending on the metal that it's looking for. Some metals are easy to see, some metals are not. Some metals I need really high levels in order for it to see it. And some metals I don't need the concentrations large at all. They can be less than one part per million if they want to. That's just something that I don't really know until I go and look up settings for the atomic absorption. All right, so here's a picture of the atomic absorption in case you're wondering before we go further into this discussion. This is what we're going to be using to measure the peel and how it broke up, and this will tell us how much zinc there is present in our solution. So in the AA, it's going to basically use a light bulb, and that's what we see over here. And the light bulb is going to be directed into this chamber. This chamber is going to have a big flame that's going to be super hot, so don't put your fingers in it, please, and don't roast marshmallows in it. And then that flame will break up, and it frees up zinc. Whee! There goes zinc. And these bulbs will allow zinc to absorb energy and the detector, which is the eyeball of the instrument, is over here. And it measures how much energy is absorbed by the light bulb due to the presence of zinc. The more zinc's present, the more absorbance that the instrument sees. And it knows the concentration based on the absorbance values. All right. Uh, we're also talking about part per million here, folks. So what exactly is part per million? Well, here's an example. Uh, this instrument for zinc cannot go very high in part per million. We have to stay on the low end. And the low end, I'm talking about your highest standard, will be a two and a half part per million standard. A part per million, see this jug over here to the right? All right, all of those are blue balls all the way through. There is one red ball in that jug. That represents one part per million. One red ball in a million total balls. That's the issue. All right, so let's kind of wrap these concepts together before we go further, before I lose you. Maybe I've already lost you, I don't know. But let's kind of do it in baby steps. Number one, we have a tablet. We put it in the dissolution. It's broken up. At the end of one hour in this monograph, because that's what the monograph tells me, I need to do this in terms of 60 minutes. I'm going to take a poll, and then I need to analyze that on the instrument. And that instrument is going to be an AA instrument that is made to see zinc. And I know how much zinc is going to be present from the tablet because we just talked about that calculation. I take the stated milligrams on the label, divide it by 0.9 because that's how much water we used. That was in the monograph. And I get a concentration. Whatever number shows up on your pill bottle, that's what you need to use right here. But this is way too strong. And that strong tablet aliquot needs to be diluted down. And this is the kicker right here. It needs to be diluted down to be proper for atomic absorption. 
All right, so how do we know how to dilute it? Well, your standards that you're going to have to prep for this particular lab experiment is going to tell you a little bit about what to do. So in these directions, it's going to tell you to obtain a 1,000 part per million solution. And this 1,000 part per million solution of zinc will come from a primary bottle, like what you see on the screen. This primary bottle will be a 1,000 ppm, and it will have a certificate that came along with it to prove that it was a 1,000, so we can trust it. And it looks like I need to make a series of standards from it when I pull up the directions for the zinc um, uh, lab procedure. Okay, well, with these standards, a thousand is way too strong. If I'm telling you that 30s and 50s are way too strong, then you know good and well the thousand is going to be too strong. So the lab directions are going to tell you first make a 50 part per million from the 1,000. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, this is a dilution, right? I'm diluting the 1,000 down to 50. So it's MV equals MV. So I have a 1,000 ppm solution. And I want to know, how much of that do I need to use? In order to make a 50 part per million solution, and the lab directions are going to say make 25 mils or 50 mils or 100 mils, whatever you decide is the best. So let's just do 100 mils, right? It's okay. Whatever we want to make. This is the setup for that problem. I'm starting with a 1,000. I need to dilute it to a 50. I use the dilution equation to dilute it down to 50. So I get 1,000x equals 50 times 100. All right, so 50 times 100 is going to be 5,000. So I'll solve for x by dividing by 1,000. And then what I'll end up with is X equals five. So it looks like I'll take five mils and I'll put it into a hundred mil flask and I'll dilute up to the line with water. And that will give me a 50 part per million solution that I will then generate standards for. And those standards will go from 0.5 to 2.5 in range. And this gives me an idea of where my sample needs to be, all right? My sample tablet needs to be between 0.5 and 2.5 ppm. So by using the previous calculation, folks, if I go back and take a look at this 33 ppm sample, I need to know how much of that to use in order to make something that works in that concentration range. So let's just be easy. I mean, that thing said 0 0.5 to 2.5. Let's just kind of smack dab it in the middle and just choose one. I need to dilute this solution down to a 1 ppm. And let's say I need to make 100 mils of it. Well, I do the same thing. 33 times X is 33X equals 1 times 100. And 1 times 100 is going to be 100. So X is equal to 100 divided by 33. And if you need the calculator, folks, then use that. I don't know what you do in the privacy of your house, right? So 100 divided by 33.3, there you go. So that will give you the amount of volume that you should be using in order to make this solution. So about three mils. So I'm gonna take three mils of the aliquot that I have pulled from the dissolution chamber and I'm going to add that to a 100 mil flask and dilute up to the line with solvent. These solvents that are used for the peel, the solvents that are used for the standards will be a 0.125 molarity hydrochloric acid solution. So again, that 0.125 molarity hydrochloric has to be diluted and it has to be prepared by you. All right, so to make standards, just kind of um, a tidbit of information, we often start with a volumetric flask. Normally, I put a little bit of solvent down in here in the bottom, whatever that solvent is. Maybe it's water, maybe it's something different. I add a little bit or my volume that I'm supposed to add to the flask, and then I top it off to the line with water, and then I invert it and I shake it really, really well, all right? The directions are also going to tell you that you need to make 100 mils of each standard. It will lay out what you need a pipette. It will tell you how to prepare those standards and how to get them ready. 
It is just simply the fact of how do you dilute your own pill to make sure that it works between 0.5 to 2.5 ppm that's what we're after and folks that really depends it depends on the pill that you get it depends on the milligram that stated on the label so everyone's will not be the same so you just want to pay attention to the label statement once more okay another thing i would like to say is that the aa instrument is not linear the aa instrument is actually an instrument that gives me a curvy line and we allow the instrument to do its own regression line and its own data analysis very often for this reason. Because if I took these values and I try to put them into Excel to make a linear regression, it will not work. The linearity on these machines, depending on the metal that we're looking for, can be a very, very tight window. So because of that, we allow the machine to do this curvy line. It's made to analyze the curvy line. It likes the curvy line, and it will tell me the concentration based on that curvy line that it gets. So we let the machine do the work for us this time, and there's really no spreadsheet work on our part. All right. So there's the kind of process of making the standards. We start with 1,000. We make a 50. From the 50, we go through and we make the other series the way the directions tell us to make them. I do not use water to dilute to the line. I use a 0 0.01 or 0 0.125 hydrochloric acid in order to do this. Okay. The monograph also gives me settings for the instrument. And here are the settings in case you need them. The settings is atomic absorption. That's the mode that we're going to be running in. The wavelength for zinc is 213.8, so this machine will be scaled in to that value. The lamp is a zinc lamp because we're looking for zinc metal. The flame is an air and acetylene flame. That's a welder's torch flame that will be used to make the flame in the machine. And the blank that needs to be used is that 0.125 hydrochloric acid that you have prepared in the lab before all of this got started. All right. Okay, so in a nutshell, that's basically the overview of the lab that we're doing. All right, so we're going to get a zinc tablet, and the zinc tablet will have a milligram on the label. We are going to put that into a disintegration instrument and see if it breaks apart in 30 minutes with a disc. And then we're going to put that zinc tablet into the dissolution system and see how that breaks up over the course of 60 minutes. And at 60 minutes, I'll do a pull of that vessel and that aliquot. All right, now let me pull up the lab directions. So here's the laboratory write up. And what you're gonna see is um, it's gonna give you directions on how to make the 1000 ppm zinc. And folks, you really don't have to do this at all. Uh, this is pre-made. If we didn't have any, this is the way that we would make it until we ordered some. But this is already prepared for you. So this is going to be good to go. You don't even really have to look at that box. That's just in there for your information if we do need to make it on the fly. So with that 1,000 ppm, this standard stock solution B says make a 50 microgram per mil. This is also known as part per million. I don't want you to get confused. It goes by either unit. Uh, microgram per mil and ppm and milligram per liter. It's all the same. Okay. So 50 milligrams per liter of zinc from a standard stock solution A diluted with 0.125 normal hydrochloric acid. So 25 or 50 mils, again, that's up to you, whatever you want to make. Once more, that's an MV equals MV. I am using the 1000. I want to know how much of that to use. And I want to make a 50 part per million. And let's say that I want to make a 50 milliliters of that. So there you go. There's the dilution equation. You just have to solve for X. And that will be the volume of the 1000 ppm that you need in order to make this solution. Uh, this also, though, says 0.125 normal hydrochloric. Don't use water. So we're going to have to make that again on our own. That's not going to be prepared. And it's another dilution step. It's MV equals MV. So the molarity here is 12 and a half. 
and the volume, I don't know what to use. That's what I'm trying to solve for. And I need to make a 0.125 molarity solution or normality solution. It's the same for hydrochloric acid. And I need to make a thousand mils of this stuff. So folks, there's your setup. You just solve for X and see what you end up with. So 0.125 times 1,000 divided by 12.5. And that will give me the amount of concentrated hydrochloric to use to make that diluent with or that solvent. All right. One of the things I want to say here, though, is this concentrated hydrochloric, it will smoke when you make the sample. So don't be alarmed, don't be surprised. It will do it, it will generate some heat. I just hope it doesn't blow up in your face. So do it under a fume hood if possible. And then the standard solutions, this is what's actually gonna be ran on the AA instrument. So from the 50 that you have made from here, that standard stock B, we are going to take one mil of it into a flask, two mils, into a different flask, three mils into a different flask, four mils into a different flask, and five mils into a different flask. These flasks will be 100 mil flask, and we will dilute up to the line, not with water, but again, with hydrochloric acid. That is why we make so much. That's why we make a 1,000 volume of it because we need it for all the standards and we need it for the sample as well. And we need it for the blank. All right, the dissolution setup here, 900 mils of water, 75 RPM, 60 minutes, that came from the USP monograph. The disintegration, 900 mils of water, disc, 30 minutes, 37 degrees. That comes straight from the monograph. After the pill breaks down, we're gonna take an aliquot, just pull put it into a test tube, leave it be. And then we're going to dilute it to make it fit the standards. Again, we talked about how to dilute that pill solution in order to make it work in that concentration range. Now, at the very end of this, we want to know how much of the pill gets dissolved. So what will happen here is that you will take your PPM value that you get from the instrument. And the easiest way is then take the theory PPM of what you should have gotten, divide these two, and times by 100. That will let you know the percentage of the pill that has dissolved. Uh, typically in dissolution, they really like 90 to 110% to be dissolved. And the reason that they give you this window is they know all of it's not gonna be dissolved exactly and some of it could still be left behind. So that's why they go lower and they go higher because they know that that pill could have maybe a little bit more than maybe 50 milligrams in it or 30 milligrams in it, whatever your label states. So they give them a cushion, they give them a wiggle room and they go 10 below and 10 above. So 90 to 110% is really what we are after here. So take your part per million that you get from the instrument Divide it by the theory part per million that you calculated that the instrument should have seen based on the dilution scheme and multiply by a 100. And folks, there's how you get the percentage of the pill that has been dissolved. The disintegration, purely qualitative. In your lab book, you're just going to write down, did it break apart or did it not? That's really all that you do there. Dissolution requires a little bit more math, okay? All right, so that's it of the dissolution and disintegration. So I hope that this maybe has cleared some things up or maybe it's just made them worse. Uh, but if you've got questions, let me know. Use this video, answer those pre-lab questions. Those pre-lab questions are gonna be some calculations. So just be ready for them. Uh, and until I see you in the lab, good luck.